You're watching Eye on Africa. I'm James Creedon. These are our headlines this evening. Tunisians have been voting this Monday in a referendum on whether or not to further concentrate powers in the hands of the president, Kais Sayed. We'll hear more from Andrew Hillier in Tunis. Emmanuel Macron has kicked off a three-nation trip to West Africa starting today, Monday, in Cameroon before visiting Benin and Guinea-Bissau. More on that coming up. And we'll get a flavour of some African photography on display at the annual photo festival in Arles in the south of France. The Ghanaian photographer, James Barner, is being honoured amongst others. More on that a little bit later on. Thanks for watching. Now, critics have been calling it a power grab. Tunisia's president is aiming to concentrate powers in the presidency over the parliament. Uh, Tunisians have been voting yes or no on a constitutional reform uh, this Monday. And Andrew Hillier is in Tunis following uh, events for France 24. Uh, good evening, Andrew. Um, I understand voter turnout figures have been issued. Uh, what more can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's right, James. Well, the uh, latest uh, figures on voter uh, uh, turnout that we have uh, around uh, around uh, 22 percent. Uh, that figure is consider considerably uh, lower uh, for Tunisians uh, living abroad. Now, uh, going into this uh, referendum, there was a lot of concern about uh, voter apathy. And, uh, you know, I have to tell you that um, my impression of uh, the campaigning in the run-up to this vote, especially in, in the last two days in Tunis, is that we haven't really seen as much campaigning as you'd expect, you know, especially um, uh, given the significance of uh, this referendum and how it could uh, alter the course of Tunisian politics. There were uh, um, a, a couple of uh, protests uh, against the uh, draft constitution over the weekend, uh, one of which ended in violent uh, scuffles with the, with the um, police. There was a, a smaller demonstration in favour of the uh, new constitution yesterday, again, in the uh, centre of Tunis. Another thing to bear in mind is that today is a public holiday in Tunisia, so a lot of Tunisians are opting to spend uh, the day with their families or at the beach, uh, and, uh, so, so not really uh, here to vote. So we'll see uh, later on when we get uh, an update on those figures uh, whether uh, voter turnout has be, is, is higher than it is uh, at, at the moment. All right. And you, you were at various different polling stations around uh, Tunis today, Andrew. Any, any, more, any more you can glean from those trips to polling stations? Yeah, that's right, James. Well, we visited three different uh, voting stations uh, today uh, in the capital, Tunis. Uh, in the morning, uh, we went to uh, Esarouni. Uh, it's a uh, working class neighborhood in the western suburbs of the capital. And now, uh, just to give you an idea of uh, how we were welcomed uh, when we got there, uh, officials were happy to let us uh, speak to, uh, to to voters and to film uh, their their reactions, which is normal given that we have uh, the, 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 those media uh, accreditations and we, are, we were, of course, operating within the rules. Now, contrast that with how we were the reception we had when we went to Ariana, which is a much more affluent part of the capital in northern Tunis. That's where President Kai Said. Uh, cast his vote. Uh, when we got there, we tried uh, speaking and uh, filming uh, voters after they cast their ballots, and there was an election official who uh, intervened and tried to stop us from uh, uh, from from filming um, uh, voters, telling us that we uh, didn't have the right to do that. That's despite the fact that we had our official accreditation, and all that happened under the nose of uh, a Tunisian election uh, observer who, uh, who who didn't uh, intervene. So that that really gives you an idea of uh, how the how your impression. Of of uh, how this vote has gone can change depending on uh, which voting station you go to. OK, Andrew, thank you for that update. And of course, you'll, you'll be keeping us informed of uh, the results as they come in uh, presently. Thanks for that. Emmanuel Macron's tricky visit to Africa, that's what Le Monde newspaper has been calling it. The French president has kicked off a tour of Cameroon, Benin and Guinea-Bissau. That visit comes at a time when uh, French influence in Africa is being called into question in several countries. Jean-Emile Jamin has more. As Emmanuel Macron begins his four-day tour of West Africa, rebranding is on his mind. On his first diplomatic trip outside Europe since re-election, the French president is seeking to reboot post-colonial relations with the continent. Obviously, it's very good news for Africa, Central Africa and Cameroon. When we see the current socio-political context with the hostility of France in Mali, the war in Ukraine, it's a very good thing. 
Macron's first stop in Cameroon will see him meet with the country's 89-year-old president, Paul Bia, the world's longest-serving non-royal leader. Discussions are likely to center on food production and how the country will fill the region's supply vacuum hit hard by the war in Ukraine. But rights groups have warned Macron that he faces a difficult task in sharing ideas with Bia, who is accused of ruling with an iron fist. We know that France is a country of human rights. Everyone has their faults, but it is a country of human rights. And it wouldn't be right for President Macron to come here without putting human rights issues, which are well respected in France, on the table with his counterpart. That is our wish. Macron is likely to receive a decent reception on Wednesday from former French colony Benin, after France returned the country's historic treasures stolen by its own forces in 1892. But with French troops pulling out of Mali, the focus will be on preventing a spillover of Islamist insurgents to the north of the country. In the final leg of Guinea-Bissau on Thursday, France's president will explore plans to build a French school on local government-designated land. Underlying his trip, Macron hopes to build on pledges made at February's EU-Africa summit to increase European Union investment in African infrastructure and agriculture. Meanwhile, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov was in Congo Brazzaville earlier this Monday. That was uh, the second leg of a five-day tour of Africa to try to strengthen Moscow's ties with the continent. African countries, <coughs> excuse me, have so far avoided taking sides openly over the war in Ukraine. Many depend on Russian grain, oil and gas. Our regional correspondent Clément Bonnero has more. Sergei Lavrov was given a very warm welcome as he touched down in Oyo, northern Congo, on Sunday evening. The Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs quickly posting photos on social media of the minister shaking hands with his Congolese counterpart Jean-Claude Agakoso. The aim, of course, being to show that Russia is far from being isolated on the international stage. Now, this was the first visit by a Russian foreign affairs minister to Congo, even though friendly ties go back to the 1960s when Congo Brazzaville became a Marxist Leninist single party state. Speaking at a press conference earlier on Monday, Lavrov hailed the continuing friendship between the two nations, praising especially Brazzaville's refusal to take sides in the Ukrainian conflict. Today, we gave high appreciation to the actions of the Congolese president and the Congolese Minister of Foreign Affairs. We thank them for their balanced and responsible position on the situation in Ukraine. Sergei Lavrov also addressed criticism that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has caused a global hunger crisis. Many countries across the continent face rising food prices and worrying levels of food insecurity as they depend heavily on Ukrainian grain. But Lavrov insisted that the West, and not Russia, is to blame. Our Congolese friends understand very well the causes of the current food crisis that have been brewing over the last three years. The main cause is the West's hateful policies. After Egypt and Congo, Sergei Lavrov is expected in Uganda and Ethiopia, two countries which have also had a long history of balancing strong relations with the West and good ties with Moscow. Clément Bonnero there. Now, tensions were high today in Goma in eastern DR Congo. Thousands of demonstrators took to the streets demanding the departure of UN peacekeepers there. Uh, some even stormed uh, at that UN base. Others blocked roads and chanted slogans against the mission known as MONUSCO. That MONUSCO mission has come under regular local, local criticism for having failed to stop fighting in the conflict-torn east bordering Rwanda. There are over 120 armed groups operating in the region, the most notorious being the M23 group. Ongoing conflict has displaced millions of people. Let's take a listen uh, to some protesters in Goma today. After 22 years, it cannot guarantee civilian protection. It is incapable to do its job of monitoring events. The Congolese government concluded that the M23 group was supported by Rwanda, but the MONUSCO operation didn't. We're going to burn and destroy every single military base so they will have to leave. They should let us defend ourselves. We don't want the MONUSCO operation because we have our own police, our army, other units that can guarantee our safety, no matter what the sacrifices or consequences. We're going to fight until the MONUSCO mission leaves.
Now, every year, the southern French city of Arles hosts a, a major photography festival. Clovis Casali uh, went along this year for France 24, uh, where several African artists are on display, including James Barner, celebrated Ghanaian photographer. Let's take a look. Designed by Frank Gehry, the Luma Tower is a cultural landmark of Arles. This art centre currently celebrates the works of James Barner. The Ghanaian photographer moved to London in 1959. One morning, a newspaper asked him to go to Covent Garden Market. I saw things different from what I was used to. I should have interviewed everybody that I photographed, but I didn't talk to anybody. In fact, those pictures have not been published. You know, it, it should have been published as a story, either a black man's view of Covent Garden. He photographed the African diaspora and documented the end of colonialism. He returned to Accra in the 1970s to share knowledge, establishing the country's first color photo processing lab. And photography is so influential. But if one becomes a photographer, one should have good education so that he has good purpose of using it. At 93 now, I say I'm leaving. But before I leave, I'm noticing that I'm being uh, noted to be an inspirer, especially from the young ones. This is what, something that I'm very proud of. In a quiet part of Arles lies La Madeleine, a new artist's residence. It offers Maya Inès Tuam a chance to make contacts. She grew up in France and was 25 years old when she discovered Algeria, the country of her parents. I tell fictional stories about migration using typical objects that become elements in my pieces. I look for these objects in France, but in special shops for the African diaspora, or I borrow them from friends, family or collectors. Her pictures are exhibited in a church along others all competing for the Roderin Discovery Award. Celeste Lewenberg's project also explores family heritage, revisiting the works of her mother, a visual artist, punk and feminist. Self-taught photographer Saif Kousmat looks at the endangered oasis in his native Morocco. Arles is a unique opportunity for this new guard to showcase its talent. All right, that's all for tonight's edition. Thanks for watching. Good night.